The word inspire literally means to breathe in. And there's a tradition, I think actors still sometimes use this, that uh, you breathe in when you have a new idea. Well, we want our kids to have new ideas. So, in a sense, being inspirational is our job. Nevertheless, there's a whole mythology that's grown up around this idea of the inspirational, charismatic teacher. You've seen Hollywood versions of this. These unconventional figures make strangely effective relationships with uh, difficult, disaffected children. But actually, I think this is potentially insulting to the teaching profession. It's also exclusive. Strangely enough, it can actually exclude children who are relegated to the role of awestruck audience or fans of the teacher. And actually, it can also exclude other teachers. The view grows that these charismatic individuals are fortunate. They were born with these personality gifts. The rest of us can't aspire to that. I simply don't agree. I believe that inspirational teaching can be learned. I've been working and uh, writing in these areas for the last few years and here's one formula that might just help you build more inspiration into your work. A few years ago, Tim, a member of my English department, said to me, I know why you always pair me with Amy for the A-level teaching. It's because she's really creative and I'm really well organised and between the two of us we make a perfect teacher. He was absolutely right. Teaching's full of these paradoxes that we need to resolve. For example, trainee teachers are always told very early on to be firm and friendly, which perhaps isn't as easy as it sounds, but it's one of these paradoxes that we need to make sense of in the classroom to create what I'm calling a sort of dynamic tension. I'm suggesting that you think about what teachers do in classrooms in terms of opposites. And it might be helpful to position yourself on those continuums and to consider how you might pull yourself towards the other end of the continuum. Not working at one end, not working in the middle, but somehow drawing both ends together, being Tim and Amy. For example, are you an expert teacher or an interactive teacher? Perhaps it's time to think about how you need to reconcile those roles in your own practice to create a dynamic tension and a balance in your classroom. The expert teacher stands at the centre front. He has strong subject knowledge and probably strong subject enthusiasm. The children can sometimes find it heavy going. He tends to talk more than he listens although some others appreciate knowing where they are, understanding what's going on, and think that they're going to get pretty good examination results. The interactive teacher, on the other hand, is rarely at the centre of the room. He lives in the body of the classroom, helping children with the activities and resources and tasks that he's devised for them. The lessons might sometimes seem a little bit disorderly, but they are exciting and enjoyable. Looking at these two images of teaching, it's tempting to see the expert teacher as the old-fashioned version. Somebody who needs to learn from the interactive teacher, and certainly, of course, he does. He needs to make his lessons more varied and inclusive. But it's also possible, of course, that if you see yourself as predominantly an interactive teacher, perhaps it's time to think about the other end of that continuum and how the expert might have something to tell you about pace and structure in your lesson. What I'm suggesting is that you think about these opposites as continuums. You position yourself on the continuum and then you consider you know, how you might make contact with the other side. For example, if you're predominantly a plan teacher, how can you reconcile that with having spontaneity in your lessons? Because you can. You can plan spontaneity into your lessons. What about, for example, pupil opinion? If you're a creative teacher, how can you reconcile that with being a structured teacher? 
Actually, structure can generate creativity. The structure can be the problem that the teacher creates, and that problem has to be solved by the creativity of the pupils. To take another example, are you a sustained teacher or an eventful teacher? Sustained is good, of course. It works through a process. It gets the job done. It gets the coursework in. But do you need to think about creating some memorable events? For example, a little bit of peer assessment. On the other hand, those very eventful lessons, though they're exciting and enjoyable, can lead to a loss of learning sometimes because they lack those quiet moments of reflection and consolidation that pupils need to make sense of the learning. This is one of the best lessons I ever saw. It was a maths lesson. The teacher drew a vertical line on the board and started making marks on either side of it. Very quickly the pupils became involved and after 10 to 12 minutes of activity the teacher reached a point where he defined what the lesson was about. Until then, no word had been spoken. The lesson was about symmetry. I thought it was effective because he didn't just define the word then apply it, he led them towards an un understanding of that very abstract idea of symmetry from the very concrete beginning of marks on the board that they could all see and remember. This was a genuinely inspirational lesson and I'm sure that was because this maths teacher reconciled those opposites of the concrete and the abstract. I'm suggesting to you that if you can identify some of those paradoxes, some of those continuums, and we've talked about some of them today, the expert but interactive teacher, the sustained but eventful teacher, you can position yourself on one of those lines and try and make contact with the other side. And if you can manage that, perhaps you can grow inspiration in your own practice.